You're watching Daily Debrief and in today's episode we are going to be talking about Haiti which is going through quite tumultuous times. The acting Prime Minister and acting President Oriol Henry resigned a couple of days ago amidst a mounting crisis. We have heard reports of gang violence, there's a lot of poverty, various kinds of social crises that are gripping the country and a lot of that has to do with the lack of democracy, with the lack of any representative system, the kind of stranglehold that Oriol Henry who was for a long time backed by key powers including the US had on the country. Now Oriol Henry has finally resigned. There are talks of some kind of a transition system towards elections. To find out more we go to Zoe. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. So, could you first maybe take us through what has been happening in Haiti over the past few days? Why was the acting president forced to resign? And what has been the political context of the past in recent times, for instance? Uh, as you said, Prashant, yes, uh, the situation in Haiti is critical. Um, late on Monday night, uh, Ariel Henry, who was the acting prime minister and president of the country, resigned. Uh, he announced this. This was also announced uh, following a meeting of CARICOM, along with other international partners and so-called Haitian stakeholders. Um, his resignation comes amid an upsurge of violence, um, which saw uh, an attempted airport takeover, which has, you know, caused great disruptions of what to uh, normal airport traffic and actually planes being able to arrive and leave. Um, a massive prison break. Um, Ariel Henry had actually traveled outside the, com the country in recent weeks to visit Kenya. Um, we'll get back to that about why he was there in a minute. Um, and he, essentially he was unable to return back to Haiti. Um, and again, there have been for the past several years, people have been calling for his resignation. These calls and demands for his resignation intensified. And in light of the kind of uh, deepening crisis in the country, essentially it was decided that he would have to resign. Um, and so this, of course, once again, opens up uh, a deep problem uh, in Haiti, which has been this political institutional crisis. Um, which again has roots in the 2004 coup, but more recently, um, you know, Ariel Henry actually was took over as acting prime minister and president in 2021, um, following the assassination of Jovenel Moise, uh, who was the uh, president of Haiti, who had been um, essentially overstaying his term by by five months at the point of his assassination. He had faced widespread protests, um, both against the inconstitutional um, way in which he overstayed his term, he defied the constitution, he um, repressed very, very heavily these protests, repressed the political opposition. Um, and previously, he had also been, and you know, until his death, was deeply embroiled in different corruption scandals. So already when Ariel Henry takes office, um, there has been a long-standing kind of conflict and demand from Haitian society, from broad sectors of the opposition and different groups, demanding that a process be started, um, for there to be an actual uh, democratization, um, and for there be to be a kind of re-stabilization of um, politics in the country um, and a return to democratic order. And so Ariel Henry takes essentially asserts himself as as acting leader. He's, of course, backed by um, key members of the core group, which is a group uh, with representatives from the EU, United States, United Nations, uh, Canada, and France. Interestingly enough, these are the kind of major powers uh, that have been uh, meddling in Haitian politics for decades, um, propping up corrupt uh, leaders, uh, turning a blind eye to or even supporting all of the human rights violations that have been uh, taking place under these leaders. Um, and so, you know, the situation at hand right now is seeing um, a lot of different voices across the world. On one hand, uh, we have kind of the warmongers of the United States, the imperialist countries, saying that the situation is untenable and the only way um, to save, to save the Haitian people 
um, is to call for uh, foreign military intervention. Um, this, of course, has been widely rejected by Haitian groups uh, and the inter and you know big parts of the progressive international community. Um, and so it's Haiti right now is at again another tipping point. We've seen many tipping points in Haitian politics over the past couple of years, and always, 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 it is the outside powers, the foreign powers who are unwilling to actually listen to what the Haitian people are demanding on the streets um, and within Haiti. And rather, they're sort of taking decisions outside of Haiti without Haitian voices um, and coming up with solutions that often just imply more suffering um, and less autonomy, less sovereignty, and less ability for the Haitian people, again, to just sort of chart their own path and have the full economic and political sovereignty to really um, actually take those plans forward. Right. And a key aspect has, of course, been the question of foreign intervention itself. Multiple proposals made. Haiti also has a very, uh, you, know, un, uh, you know, a record, very dangerous record of being uh, intervened in on multiple occasions, which have brought a lot of uh, damage to society as well. Could you talk, tell us a bit about that? So, for the past several decades, uh, again, foreign military intervention has been kind of a key aspect uh, that dictates and impacts um, Haitian politics and, and life in Haiti. Um, we know that following uh, the coup and the earthquake in Haiti uh, in the 2000s, the United Nations deployed what was called the Stabilization Mi uh, Mission, which was known as MINUSTA. Um, this was a multinational um, so-called peacekeeping force, which was really a military occupation led by Brazil um, and had, again, participation of countries across the world, but was a brutal, brutal military occupation. Um, on our site, on People's Dispatch, we have several articles um, sort of shining a light on the, the deep abuses and um, human rights violations that MINUSTA was uh, complicit in, carried out. Um, we know that the cholera outbreak was directly linked um, to the presence of MINUSA troops in Haiti. There were thousands of women and girls and children uh, who were uh, who experienced sexual violence at the hands of uh, the MINUSA troops. We know that there were horrific massacres that took place um, in the popular neighborhoods in Port-au-Prince um, by the UN, UN peacekeeping troops, part of the stabilization mission, you know, the list really goes on. And Haitian organizations have been um, quite adamant in saying that foreign military intervention, you know, historically, of course, but even just contemporarily in the past uh, several years has brought great suffering on the Haitian people. And so essentially in the past couple of years, uh, as there's been these mass protests, as I said, under Jovenel Moise, even before he'd overstayed his, his, uh, his term limit, there had been mass protests against him because of his involvement, uh, him and other members of his government and his party in corruption scandals, um, embezzling the funds from Petro Caribe, um, which were meant and destined for social purposes, but um, they were involved in kind of just pocketing these funds, using them for their own um, profiteering. Uh, there were massive protests against this and also the fuel crisis, a multitude of social and economic crises that brought thousands of Haitians onto the streets to demand the resignation of Jovenel Moïse. And again, the possibility to actually, for example, have access uh, to these funds that the, the Haitian state has been robbed of so that people can have access to education, so that they can have dignified conditions, um, and that so that they can actually have the possibility of having, again, uh, a dignified life. Um, and so these protests were taking place, um, massive, massive protests uh, in 2018, again in 2019, 2020, we saw this continually. Um, and Jovenel Moïse, of course, responded with uh, widespread repression. Um, and at this point, uh, we see again, kind of this call for, for support, for being able to quell this, these outbursts by uh, these social outbursts. Um, after his assassination in July, 2021, it was again, another moment where the international community, the so-called international community, these imperialist forces said, see, 
the situation with the gangs, which of course are <laughs> armed by the United States and, you know, uh, backed by these elite groups who have held on to power. Um, they say this is getting out of hand. All of these things, protests continue against Ariel Henry. And at the same time, uh, the gang violence in the country proliferates again because uh, there are these vacuums, social economic vacuums. The Haitian people, again, do not have control over their economy. They're living with miserable conditions. Um, weapons are flowing in um, from the United States. Uh, again, elite groups in the country supporting these criminal groups. And so again, we see this rise in violence. And in this context, um, Ariel Henry actually requests, makes a formal request to the United Nations um, for foreign military intervention. This was in October, 2022. This was met with, again, widespread protests. But in October, 2023, the UN Security Council actually authorized a military uh, intervention. It was not technically, um, a, it would not technically be a UN mission. This is called the Multinational Security Support. Um, and this, at the time, you know, several months back, it was Kenya who offered to uh, lead this mission and pledged a thousand police officers. This created tensions within Kenya itself. You know, many groups, left groups, and even opposition groups said, we don't. We're not going to send our police officers to essentially another country to repress their citizens. Um, so this was met with widespread um, rejection. The Congress in Kenya and um, the High Court said that this was unconstitutional. Um, the president, Ruto, um, was trying to press forward with this. This is the context within which Ariel Henry actually visits Kenya uh, just a couple of weeks ago uh, to try to kind of seal the deal and get the Kenyan police officers. But what do you know, after he resigns, Kenya backs out and said, definitively, we are not sending any police. So the threat of a, uh, of a you know foreign military intervention actually still hangs over Haiti. This um, multinational security support, MSS, uh, is a US backed um, and kind of given the, the um, go ahead by the United Nations. They still want this to go forward. We're going to see how this evolves in the coming days. So we'll definitely continue to be watching um, what's happening in Haiti. It's a very crucial battleground right now. We know that they're continuing to face the threat of this foreign military intervention. The Haitian people say no to foreign military intervention. The people of the world say no to foreign military intervention in Haiti. Um, and this, uh, we'll see how it uh, plays out over the next couple of weeks. How much pressure will the United States put on other countries to send military personnel to be part of this mission? That remains to be seen, um, but keep following this topic on People's Dispatch. Thanks so much, Zoe, for talking to us. And that's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. Meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.